five years ago, something really terrible happened. My father joined Facebook. I know, right? So wrong. But then something unexpectedly wonderful happened. One day, a friend request popped up in my feed, and it was a friend of my dad's, and it was somebody with my last name. And it turned out to be a cousin I didn't even know that I had. My family is from Kashmir, a disputed territory that's been caught in the middle of a tug of war between India and Pakistan since 1947. For much of my childhood and even today, the political situation has been volatile, with kidnappings, assassinations, and forced migration. And that's just among my own family and friends. Because of that, my parents were reluctant to ever take me to Kashmir, as I have British and US passports. And it was always the greatest irony for me that I have two passports that provide me some of the greatest freedom of movement of anyone on Earth. And they were the one reason that I never had a chance to know my family in Kashmir. That is, until Dad joined Facebook. <laughs> People often say that social media is tearing us apart from each other and that it's just an illusion of human connection. But for those of us who are immigrants, it allows us to find connections to our cultures, to our families and our communities in ways that weren't ever possible at any other moment. Now I know so many more of my relatives than I would have thought possible, and those friend requests just keep coming and coming. I, my parents have eight and nine siblings, so I have a lot of cousins. And one of them has even become a good friend. In 2013, I received a tweet from a Twitter user and it said, sister, so nice to see you on Twitter after so long. Happy birthday. And I looked at his feed, and I saw that he was a sick living in Kashmir. I didn't really think anything of it. And a few days later, he tweeted at me again. So I wrote to him, and I said, there's no way we're not related, right? The Kashmiri Sikh community is really small, so the chances were, probably were related. He sent me a private uh, message and it said, I'm your first cousin. You're Ranjit's daughter. And I was so embarrassed that he had to tell me that he was my first cousin. And it gets worse because I had even met him. Just one day in 1996, when my parents took me to Jammu, an area south of Kashmir that's considerably safer, but in a trip filled with dozens of relatives that I was meeting for the first time, I have absolutely no recollection of meeting him. But I followed him back on Twitter, and I discovered that we had so much in common. He's also committed to social justice. And after a tragedy in our family, he started Kashmir's first suicide prevention organization. He's a thoughtful writer who pens op-eds about political violence against Sikhs in Kashmir and the need for Indians to challenge stigmas around mental illness. He's a feminist who also works on expanding education for girls in rural villages. And I've gotten to learn about his daughter, and he sends me pictures of her homework assignments and tells me about her aptitude for language and literature and says, maybe she gets it from me. We share and promote each other's work to our communities, and we've found community with each other. For much of my life, I've always wondered what my family in Kashmir thinks about me. And now, I don't have to wonder. Even just this morning, I received a message from Raminder saying, we're so proud of you. Good luck today, Banna, which means sister. 
In Kashmiri culture, the relationship between cousin and sibling is a lot more porous in the United States. So it's often common to hear us refer to a cousin brother or a cousin sister. And now, for the first time in my life, I have a bia or a big brother through the connections that I've made with Raminder on social media. And my experience isn't unique. Anyone in my immediate family could tell you a story like this one of a connection we've made through relatives and friends we haven't spoken to in decades, simply through the digital homes that we've been able to create online. My experience of immigration has been one marked by profound privilege. Due to a combination of good luck, good timing, loose immigration laws, and their occupations, my parents were able to leave Kashmir and move to Great Britain, where I was born, and later to the United States when I grew up. Other immigrants like us have a similar experience of creating digital diasporas where we maintain connections to our communities and our families and to each other simply through the participation in social media. But what about migrants for whom the situation is much more serious and even a matter of life and death? At this moment in human history, most people's experiences of migration are not like mine. Every day, refugees and asylum seekers arrive at national borders, fleeing their homelands, and wondering, will they be welcome here? And very often, the answer is no. Where can these migrants find a home when their homeland is inhospitable, and the place they hope to make their new home turns them away? They, too, create digital homes. Today's migrants are very often what Dana Dimonescu has called connected migrants. I've written about this in my own work on Syrian refugees who take selfies when they reach Europe. These are potent symbols of contemporary migration, but they're also divisive. We associate the ability to take a selfie with leisure, recreation, and tourism, and something that seems so fun, or something like we do every day, appears to be at odds with the experience of refugees and asylum seekers who are fleeing desperate circumstances and violence, danger, and poverty in their home countries. But the ability to take a selfie to send it to a family member and a friend, and to say, I am here and I am safe, is integral to creating a digital home. When these refugees and asylum seekers have smartphones, their ownership of these technologies is often used to suggest maybe their circumstances aren't as dire as they're suggesting if they have access to a cell phone and a data plan. But for these migrants, those technologies are a vital lifeline. On one hand, they're a matter of safety. Those smartphones have maps that guide their journeys. They allow them to communicate with family and friends, to share information about which routes of migration are open and closed or subject to surveillance. They offer the opportunity to maintain connections to family and friends and to others met along the way, an opportunity to remember who they are and to speak in the languages with which they are most familiar. Whether for privileged immigrant like me or for refugee and asylum seeker, the ability to build a digital home through social media is a way of finding connection and an experience of immigration that is inevitably marked by profound disconnection. So to those people who say that social media is just an illusion of connection or is tearing humans apart from each other, I say they're wrong. Now I'm more connected than ever to my family's history, present, and its future. And I never could have imagined that that would happen. And it was all because 
my dad joined Facebook. Thank you.